Welcome everyone to the 48th episode of Comic DNA, on which we will be discussing Skull Kickers, Volumes 5, titled A Dozen Cousins and a Crumpled Crown, and Volume 6, titled Infinite Icons of the Endless Epic. I am Aaron Walther, and today I am joined by my Skull Kicker discussing friends, Mr. Josh Blassingame. Josh, thanks for being here. No problem. And of course, Mr. John Parrish. John, thank you also for being here. Oh, thanks for having me. That's mm, good. Well, I mean, you know, we've we've done two episodes about Skull Kickers now. We've read the first four books. I figure we might as well finish her off and read the rest of the series, huh? Mm-hmm. Yes. Sounds like a plan. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah, because these these final two volumes, uh, it's the end of the series, volumes well, five and six, and I think it. Gosh, at this point, it probably en- it ended last year, right? Sometime last year, 2015, I think. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I want to say it was like end- October or something. The last issue came out. I think it was either October or November last year. Mhm, that's right. I, I that sounds right. So, um, one of the things that I I didn't find out about this until just like a few weeks ago. I was I was reading up on Skull Kickers and Jim Zub, the creator Jim Zub creator and writer and um i found out that he put skull kickers online available to read for free like as a webcomic as it mm-hmm. was being published by image mm-hmm. which i thought was very interesting because i not i'm not aware of any other books that do that like especially yeah. books that are it was right. published by image first it didn't start as a web yeah. comic and then move to image like it was a book he had published at image and uh uh, one of the things that I've always liked about Jim Zub, I think we've talked about this before in the other episodes, is that he is a really great resource for uh, comic book creators and people that are into self-publishing because he's very mm-hmm. he, he writes a lot of articles and he's very open kind of about the process of publishing a comic. And yeah. uh, I read a thing that he said that um, after he put it online, available to read for free, uh, his sales of the book went up, which yeah. uh, is a interesting little tidbit mm-hmm. yeah because uh i was gonna say because i think because that's how i like i had always seen the series but i think i like i think i said this i got into it that's how i got to read skull kickers was when it first went up as a web comic uh-huh. um i think i was still in japan and so that's how i got to read it so then when i came home like you know i bought the the treasure troves i bought the like the massive books mm-hmm so yeah, like it's it's a really smart thing. It's a really smart thing, and I I guess it, I don't know if it's a bunch of other image creators doing that, but I do know they're doing it for uh was it Justin Jordan uh the Luther Strode books? Oh yeah, okay. I think they just started doing that with that that series. Yeah, no, that's that's interesting. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's funny. It just struck me too. I. I'm I'm not gonna go back and listen to previous Skull Kickers episodes that we've recorded, but uh, uh-huh. I I'm almost wondering did we did we talk about Skull Kickers being available online for free like in previous episodes? Have you said that before? Sure. So you probably have. I'm so sure. I'm just an idiot who forgets things, I guess. Because I was I mean, like, yeah, it's fine. I mean, it's no been comment. like almost don't, a year. I don't need your help, Josh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's funny because I do, I do remember you saying something about reading it online in Japan, and I was like, oh, wait a minute, huh? So yeah, I, I just, I'm, I'm a doofus. I was so shocked by that just a few, few weeks ago. I learned about that. Oh well, whatever. I, I relearned about that. Uh, yeah. But yeah, um, I, uh, I'm glad that we finally got together to do this episode. Uh, this is just a little uh, background information that nobody who's listening to this podcast actually cares about. But um, I've been trying to do this. I've been trying to get this episode set up for a few weeks now. And a few weeks ago, John, you were in St. Louis at a comic book yes. convention that I was at, yes. and uh, it was it was put on by Mighty Con, St. Louis Comic Con, put on by Mighty Con. Mm-hmm. And I thought, well, this would be a great opportunity to get us all together, and we can have a nice sit down and maybe grab a few beers and pizza and talk about Skull Kickers. But then, of course, that uh, was. Just that plan completely fell apart because of a, a whole lot of different problems that all happened at once. And anybody who's actually gone to a comic book convention, and I don't mean go to a comic convention, I mean somebody who's tabled at a comic convention, you always end up having way less free time than you initially thought the weekend mm-hmm. of the show. Because, you know, you're just 
you're wiped out just from driving, you're wiped out from standing behind a table, even sitting behind a table just wipes you out. So, yeah. so yes, it, it was very much, uh, it was a great idea, but it didn't happen. But, so I'm glad we finally get it going now. But uh, incidentally, just as a little detour, John, how did the convention go for you? Um, I really enjoyed it. Um, yeah, it was cool. I got uh, my, my younger brother who just, well, he graduated last year. Um, he had never been, like, we'd gone to a couple conventions, so it was, like, our first time, like, as both as adults going on essentially a trip out of state. And, you know, he did a lot of good work. He helped me, like, he helped me sell books. Uh, I mean, I did pretty well. I, I did decently. I did better than I thought I was going to do. Um, well, that's good. You know, yeah, a lot of people like Clusterfuck, so... That yeah, was... you had the uh, you had the trade paperback. Uh, yeah, was this like the first like convention anything you like publicly you've done selling the book? Yeah, yeah, because oh, okay. it, it came out in like May, so this was the first time. Yeah, this was my first time like having uh, the full trade. So I mean, it did pretty well. I sold like I sold like I mean like eight copies, which I don't know if that's like um that's like that's amazing to me, um, that's... considering I hadn't had it out that long right yeah it's like it's making its little print book debut yeah uh, it, it was a small convention too yeah uh, it yeah, wasn't so... it wasn't that big it was kind of like a small yeah. kind of it wasn't a hotel but i mean it could have been in like a hotel conference room kind of a convention yeah uh, so i mean yeah. I, I i enjoyed it yeah well I'm, I'm glad you had a good time yeah so um you, we were talking at the convention and um, one of the things we were we were talking about the this upcoming Skull Kickers podcast, and uh, you had mentioned to me um, that you had met Jim Zub at a different convention. Uh, and I, as as we previously established, I have a terrible memory and I forget everything. Apparently, especially about Skull Kickers, when we talk, when you <laughs> tell me things about Skull Kickers, I forget it. So, um, what was that? What was that story about? What happened there? Oh, um, I ended up going to uh, C2E2 for, I think I only went, I went like for one day, I went on Saturday. Okay. Um, and so I think I had previously gone and uh, Edwin, was it Edwin Huang and Misty Coates were there. So I had gotten them to sign the big treasure trove books I had. I think I bought, I bought them and they signed them, but Jim Zub wasn't there. So this year he was there. Mm. So I brought the first two treasure troves and bought the third one and had them him sign all of them uh -huh. nice. um and just talk to him. Um he was really cool. Uh I picked up he has a he had a book about Japan uh and I forgot the name of it off the top of my head just like that. I don't have it with me cuz <laughs> I don't want to step Is it Wayward? Huh? Wayward. Yeah. Wayward. Sorry. Yeah. yeah, Wayward. And so, you know, like I said, I lived in Japan for a couple years so I thought it'd be like a, you know, pick it up and see. Mm -hmm. Um but yeah, I told him about the podcast and how we had done, you know, some episodes some time ago, and he thought it was really cool. Um, but like I said, he was really nice, so that's great. Yeah, Jim Jim Zub has always um, uh, like uh, retweeted our our podcast episodes and posted on Facebook. And uh, if you've ever been to our website, comicdna.podbean.com, or is it the other way around, podbean.comicdna? I don't remember. I don't pay attention to that stuff. Um, <laughs> if if you look on our on our uh, our uh, episode playlist, you'll see that our Skull Kickers episodes have about a thousand percent more listens than any of the other episodes. So yes, we uh, thank Jim Zub for um, uh, always uh, sharing our conversations about him. So let's uh, enough enough of uh, this fawning over Jim Zub and how great of a guy he is. Let's get into the nitty gritty of these books. Um, you know, it's been a while since we talked, mm -hmm. uh, so I want to I wanna just like have a recap, just kind of recap what, what we felt about the books, about the first four volumes. Because uh, if I recall, I'll go first. Okay. If I recall the way, the way I, I, again, I'd have to go back and listen to the episodes to know exactly what I said, but I'm not going to do that. So I might, I might have actually said something different in the episodes than what I'm saying now, but, you know, whatever. Um, if I recall, thinking back on the series as a whole, I think the first volume was okay. It wasn't, like, great. It, 
didn't rope me in, but I liked it enough to keep reading. Mm -hmm. And and I thought volume two got a lot funnier. Like like I felt like the comedy was a little stronger in volume two. Mm -hmm. um, volume three was kind of just uh, I think that's when they started. I think that's when he started introducing some of the plot elements that would sort of grow to become building into the what the becomes sort of sort of the ongoing plot, the big climax. Mm -hmm. And I thought volume three again was okay. It it had some good jokes in it though. So it was, again, mm -hmm. enough to keep me reading. And then volume four, I really really liked. I thought volume four was just laugh out loud funny. If I the the one thing that stands out to me, I remember the the two narrators. You know, constantly arguing back and mm -hmm. forth about who was narrating the story. Uh, that's where um, Rolf the dwarf died, and they had the whole issue where he was dead. Yeah. Uh, and like the, they were telling the two stories at the same time. Like Rolf was just like a corpse in the ocean. <laughs> brilliant, <laughs> yeah. brilliant. Like, yeah. So actually, I would actually say it's some of the funniest comics I've ever read. So, so like the first like three volumes, I was like. Good, okay, okay, you know, funny, you know, good, good stuff. But then I thought four was just like really great. Like I really loved volume four. Like, well, they had hit their stride, and he, you know, obviously realized what he wanted to do. Yeah, yeah. And that's where more yeah. of the story formed as well. It is, yeah. More of the story really kind of developed. Like it sort of like got into the a meaty, a meaty plot, as it were. And and I and I maintain, I think that he started to really stretch his comedic legs of. Not just not just comedy of like silly situations, but like like stylistically like purely comic book comedy, like things that you can only do in comics that are really funny, like the the dueling narrators and mm -hmm. and the way they do like the different visual gags uh, with like the panels, like again going back to that dead Rolf issue, like with the panel layouts of just like you just have the, mm -hmm. the panels running along the bottom of each page of Rolf's corpse corpse floating in the ocean, uh, hilarious just very funny and I thought that was some of the smartest comedy I've ever seen in a uh, in a comic book that was that's not like a uh, I, this is a tricky thing to say because there are lots of really funny comics out there but I'm specifically referring to like an action adventure book that's, mm -hmm. that's not being drawn by a cartoonist I think that it's a really I think that it's a really rare thing for like a writer to be able to pull off a lot of comedy in a comic, mm -hmm. whereas most of the funny books come from like a cartoonist, somebody who's writing and drawing the whole thing, and it's just like purely distilled vision of this one person. Yeah. So I, I think that I do think that that's a challenge that a lot of uh, comic book writers have trying to be funny in comics. Because it's, like, being funny in comics is not the same as being funny in a movie or being, f like, if you're writing a script. Like, writing comedy for a TV show or writing comedy for uh, a radio show or whatever, it's different than writing comedy for a comic. And I think that, I think that uh, it, it doesn't always, sh like, comedy doesn't always play, like, in a written form from writers. As opposed to, again, mm -hmm. going back to my, as opposed to cartoonists. I mean, freaking comic strips, like, we could talk about... The, the Far Side is, like, one of the funniest comics I've ever read. Like, that's mm -hmm. that's comedy mm -hmm. in a comic, but that's, that's not the same thing as what we're talking about with Skull Kickers being a really funny comic. And I'm sorry for that lengthy digression there, but uh, it's a weird thing to try and explain, I think. Yeah. But anyway, so um, th th those were my thoughts on the uh, first four volumes. Um, what were your guys' thoughts? Uh, whoever wants to go first, uh, fight for it. I was gonna say, Josh, you can go. <laughs> it's for victory, <laughs> Josh wins. <laughs> victory. No, like I said, uh, I kind of agree with you. Uh, the first, you know, couple issues, you know, he was finding his stride, mm -hmm. and then um, really kind of picks up. Like he really kind of narrows it down. He perfects his humor, perfects his visual gags, um, with all that stuff, and just he's. Like the character development or the character setup, for the most part, is out of the way. He can focus on the story and what he wants to tell, and that's really apparent going f from three to six. Yes. Or yeah, three, four, five, and six. Mm -hmm. And the and these next two, it, you you know, they do a little bit more in five, you know, just at the very beginning, and then 
it's you know just gold. I, I do think five and six are my favorite mm-hmm. out of all of them. Well, don't jump the gun so. yet, Josh. We haven't gotten to that part of the podcast. Uh, okay, okay, <laughs> okay. Uh, John, give us a recap on volumes one through four. Um, like I mean, like we're pretty much gonna echo each other. Like I, <laughs> I, I, I do enjoy the first two like volumes. It's like it was more my. I, I think it's like I just liked the just the humor of it and just like the just the like you could kind of see the beginnings of what was what was happening like you said he he was getting his stride Mm -hmm. uh setting the building blocks and things like that um but yeah so like in the first two volumes and then volumes three and four um i i think like you said i liked the volume i think i liked volume four a lot like a lot more Mm -hmm. um but I, I, like I said, I just I enjoyed it. I don't, I don't have anything. And plus, I, I haven't read those two in a while. Like I read the most recent one, mm. but I don't think I've read the last one, the last volumes in a while. So it's hard for me to like try to go back and right, right, re, you know, all my points. But that's why this is like a part three, so people can go and get like more detail exactly, ideas from yeah. those first two. Yeah, exactly. But, yeah. So but I, I think, do think yeah. when, oh, oh go ahead go ahead go ahead okay yeah I was just saying I was saying like we talked about it and I think we talked about it in the previous uh, installment that I think you know he was an artist and he was part of like Udon mm-hmm. and that's true yeah. you know this I don't know if this was like one of his, this might have been one of probably one of his first things as like a writer and I'm sorry my neighbors are shooting fireworks oh. um, <laughs> yeah that's okay I we I, had that I'm. Okay. I'm patriotic enough to not be bothered by fireworks being shot off at inopportune times. <laughs> okay, but um, yeah, I was We're just lazy gonna say enough. that too. <laughs> so I was just gonna say that, uh, yeah, I think that it lends to his ability to probably better convey to uh, Edwin what what he wants. You know, like his visually, visual style. Yeah. Visually, he's mm-hmm. better to convey it than perhaps someone who's just a writer. And has not, you know, done art that's true, in that yeah. way, you know, drawing and things like that. So I think maybe that's why the first, you know, like he was building his style, his writing style, as opposed to like, you know, drawing it himself. Mm-hmm. So I think it was a learning process. So I think we were seeing like the, uh, you know, like him learn as he went and like, or better, or at least able to better utilize it as time went on. Yeah, that sounds very likely. That make that makes sense to me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I agree. I mean, I think it sounds like we are all kind of like you said, John. We're all kind of echoing each other. We all agree mm-hmm. that I think the crux of this, the important thing to remember, this is all that uh, despite saying things like early on it was okay but not great. I think the key is that as the series progressed, it got better and better and better, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, we would all yes. agree with that, right? Yeah. Yep. And that's going to be an important an important uh, topic that I'm going to come back to later. We're going to talk about that. But okay. until then, uh, let's just start talking about uh, Volume 5, which mm-hmm. it picked up directly after Volume 4. Mm-hmm. And... Um, and I think uh, Volume 4, in the last podcast, we, we were kind of left with this confusion of, like... Because Volume 4 ends with just, like, pure, like... It's all, like, a lot of up-in-the-air... Cliffhanger. Sp- yeah, cliffhanger, speculation yeah. about what's going on. You have the multiple versions of Rolf and Rex, and, like, they get dropped through, uh, like, a... They, they were at the uh, the bar, right? The, that, uh, what yes, is the, the gizzard. The gizzard, yeah. And then, so... Volume five picks up right after that with them in the uh, the dwarven uh, kingdom. Yes, Rolf's yeah. Rolf's home. Yeah. So Dwyer. yeah, yeah, Dwyer. Yeah. So, um, Josh, I know you already gave us a preview of how you felt about this, but I'm gonna cut you off and say real quick oh. <laughs> that uh, I liked volume five probably as much as volume four. I mm-hmm. I thought it was very funny and it just kept kept right on going with like the pace and the style and the comedic strength that was volume four so right. now josh now that you've jumped the gun what did you think about volume five <laughs> <laughs> I, I really liked it 
Personally, I'm a big fan of dwarves, so this was all about the dwarves. I, and I that knew was you awesome. would. Yeah, I, I knew you would like all the dwarf stuff. <laughs> um, that being said, it almost feels kind of like a one-off. Like, we get a lot of backstory for Rolf, and it helps set up everything. Mm-hmm. But the main story does not continue in 5. Because they get kicked out of the, uh, of the gizzard at the beginning of 5. And at the end of 5, they, go back. they come right back with not much happening to the main story in the meantime. Just some really awesome dwarven action. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was going to say that, actually. Uh, and I, I don't... I'm going to... I want to ask you what you think about the book, John, in just a second. But I okay. thought I thought uh, it was kind of interesting how Volume Six basically could have picked up right after Volume Five or Volume Four. I mean, yes. right? Like the story could have yeah. just Four could have just kept going right into Volume Six. Mm-hmm. But that being said, I really liked Volume Five. I thought it was yeah. really <laughs> funny. Um, yeah. <laughs> Well, it, it does give us a little bit more, like, we see uh, our, basically, trio uh, teams up with two of the other uh, heroes that we met. That we met. Right. Uh, I'm trying to find the page where they explain it. But basically, yeah, we've got, you know, bald Rex, mm-hmm. uh, and then just other Rex. Other Rex, got yeah. The <laughs> sword instead of a gun, and then dead Rolf, live Rolf, and then uh, <laughs> the elf. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there there are some, uh, I guess, you could say, like, essential things going on in Volume 5, mostly with, uh, not, like, tied directly to the plot, but just sort of in the, like, general, I don't even want to just say characterization of the characters, because at a certain point, mm-hmm. I maybe, maybe you could even say throughout the whole book, the characterization of the characters doesn't particularly matter, in a way, because mm-hmm. because when they start talking about the, the whole archetype thing, you know, yeah. uh, but at the same time, that is sort of what is important about Volume Five is that it's it's giving you very clear examples of these different archetype, uh, the different characters within these archetypes, and how they're mm-hmm. all yeah. like conflicting with each other, and then that all comes to the point in Volume Six where you have all of them together, you know, back at the bar. So, yes. so yes, it is kind of weird how it it sort of feels like five is just like, like a diversion, but mm-hmm. it's it's sort of like um, I would say that the the purpose in terms of the plot and like from a storytelling point of view is to just uh, first of all, I, as I said, the I think one of the most important things about Skull Kickers first and foremost is the comedy. Like, it's just, yes. is, is it entertaining? Is it funny? The answer is yes, it's funny. So that's good enough for it to be there. You know, that's really all that matters. Yeah. But uh, also it's giving you, like, real practical examples of what will eventually be talked about in Volume 6. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. But I, I do agree, I get what you're saying, Josh, with it sort of being like this weird, like, little sidestep. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Start it works, stop. but it works. Yeah, I, I liked it a lot. Uh, okay, so I've I have talked enough, John. Uh, what did you think about uh, Volume Five? Um, I enjoyed it. Um, I we like we already said it was a sidestep. It kind of went off to like like it went off to the side. It didn't you know com- it wasn't a complete step forward. Mm-hmm. But um, I enjoyed it. Um, I do have to say, like, because, like I said, I have those treasure trove books. Right. It doesn't immediately open with, uh, with the first volume five stuff. It opens up with like the like short stories. So, like, I read those first. Like, you get it you get does all this. In this one as well. I was gonna oh, ask. I actually forgot to ask Josh if those were in the trades because I read it. I actually I just read it all online. Um, oh, okay. And yes, it is it is all online. I figured that the way he has it online is the order in which it's collected in the trades. But, okay. But yeah, they, they he does like that issue of like Tavern Tales mm-hmm. yeah. where they have like short stories about the uh, like alternate versions of the characters. Right. Right? That's, a, that's in one of them. Because then, yes, this... then they come back for the end of Volume 6, which we will get yeah. to. Yeah, well, cause yeah, cause I was like, cause when I opened it, it has like all the yeah, it has like tavern tales, like it has the one about uh, Cassia the elf, mm-hmm. and like she had like her little mission, and like yes. those things. So I saw those, so I read that first. So that's mm-hmm. what came first. But 
Um, yeah, but Volume Five I really enjoyed, and like I don't even mind that it was a you know it was a side step because it was very entertaining, and I also really enjoyed seeing Rolf as a child. Yes, like, mm-hmm. that was like really adorable. Like it was just like really such cute. a cute little murder machine. Yeah, like and it's like when they like make fun of him and they break his toy, it makes you really sad. Um, but it was like uh, really enjoyable. It was really funny, and because I mean they give you Rex's backstory. So it felt like they they had to kind of give you Rolf's well, that's, backstory. Yeah. But yeah, it does tie into that whole thing. I mean, like, and like the narrators and stuff, they do that whole thing where it's like it comes back and ties into yep. uh, what they're going through. Um, but it was, like I said, I enjoyed it. It was funny. Uh, the jokes, the little War Tyke theme song. <laughs> yes. uh, like yes. I said, Baby Rolf. It was very enjoyable, very funny. Um, like I said, I enjoyed it. I, I I don't know if I enjoyed it like more than number four, mm-hmm. but I definitely enjoyed it. Like it's a it's it's a tie or it's barely edging it. Right. Like okay. they're very close to. Me. Yeah. So I, I enjoyed think, it. Yeah. Like we do have more of Rolf's story. I, if I remember correctly, we do get a little bit, you know, uh, not as deep as this issue. But we do get backstory for uh, Cassandra, or Cassandra, what the elf, Cassandra. and uh, Rex. Definitely more than uh, in earlier books. Well, yeah, mm-hmm. they he they did the they did the Rex backstory like in what well, was volume two? I was, was like the, yeah, we yeah. on the boat. Or was it, was it yeah. okay? That was volume three then. Yeah, but I mean, yeah, when the, on the pirate ship. yeah, when they're on the pirate ship, and they did the whole story about how he's like a cowboy from the old west, and right, mm-hmm. yeah. So, so that's that is true. Also, another important thing is that, like, as as I was kind of saying, like volume five is about characterization, but in a way, it doesn't matter. But it still does because it, you know, it's Rolf's turn. Like we needed to know yeah, about yeah. Rolf, you know. Yeah. So yeah, I, I I guess all this all this like hemming and hawing I'm going about about it being feeling like a diversion. It's not to say that it's not integral to the story because maybe it's maybe, not as plot heavy as some of the others. Yeah, 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 exactly. But it still is, you know, necessary. I mean, right? And, the uh, tavern. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was just gonna say, and I still maintain that even like despite all this talk about it being like like a sidestep or not like a direct continuation of the plot it's still one of my favorite books like it's i mm-hmm. it's really good like really funny yeah yeah i mean i mean how no, it... how great was it all the little children dwarves all had beards yeah like that was great and the women i was about to and say the... but the only joke that was funnier than that i freaking loved that joke when uh kusai uh what's her name john it's Kusia. It's Kusia, thank you. When Kusia is going on about, like, uh, uh, there are no women dwarves in positions of power and stuff like that, and then like, she's like, she's like, where are all the women? And, like, like two dwarves raise their hand, like, yo. <laughs> it's just like, yeah, we don't make our dwarves shave. <laughs> That's we great. don't make our women shave like you filthy elves. <laughs> exactly, yeah, yeah, we don't make our women shave. That was great. That was, that was see, that was a beautiful joke. It was, you know, set up. Yeah. Setup, punchline, juxtaposition. It was it was great. It was all there. It's very yeah. funny. I actually got a. It was a very laugh out loud moment for me. Was that 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 part with the the dwarven women and um, just the uh, the back and forth between like the old timey narrator, like narrating yeah. flashbacks, yeah. and the present day narrator uh, coming into conflict when the old timey narrator was trying to start narrating the present day stuff. Very very funny. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. I did also like the Rolf and Rex that they introduced in this one with, you know, giant uh, oh, Rolf yeah. and Mini yeah. Rex. Oh, okay. And the way they explain <laughs> that, you know, Mini Rex is, you know, bald without a, uh, a must, uh, without a beard. And they yeah. say, oh, he's just, he's got a drink in his order. You better not bring it up. <laughs> no, so he's, yeah. quote, he's still a dwarf, but he's bald. So that's their reason for that. And, you know, Rolf is giant. And it, it's the same reason. Oh, he's got a drinking disorder. <laughs> yeah, he's he's yeah he's got a condition. Yeah, uh, yeah. No, that that was very funny. I thought that joke was great too. Another laugh out loud moment for me was when yeah. when yeah giant giant Rolf is they keep referring to him as a dwarf and uh, some whoever 
it was Dead Ralph, whoever was like, yeah. you're like, he, he's not a dwarf, he's huge, and they're all like, shh, don't, don't, don't mention that, he's got a condition. <laughs> yeah, he's sensitive about <laughs> he's it. He's sensitive about his condition. He's sensitive, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, great joke, very funny. Yeah. Uh, that, uh, you know, I had talked about this in, in the previous podcast, uh, about the similarities, I don't, uh, some similarities to Terry Pratchett. Uh, I don't know how much uh, Terry Pratchett Jim Zub is right, or if he even likes Terry Pratchett, because I wouldn't say that Skull Kickers is similar to Terry Pratchett, per se. But that mm. joke reminded me of some Terry Pratchett stuff that I've read. There's okay. there's, there's a character who is um, a human that was raised by dwarves. And uh, <laughs> so he's like, for all intents and purposes, he's a dwarf, but he's huge. And uh, they do they make similar jokes about that. <laughs> like something uh, okay. like that. Because, like, you know, he's a dwarf, but, you know, don't don't mention that he's tall. Yeah. But, uh, anyway, yeah, good stuff. Um, very funny. Um, so, yeah, uh, I don't know, any... Was there anything else in Volume 5 that, that jumped out? I mean, just the, the, uh, was it the rock giants, the earth elementals, like, mm. that whole thing was really interesting, it was pretty funny. I did um, like that, yeah. I liked and when like they were the, like high fiving each other after killing people. Yeah, <laughs> after they destroyed that, uh, they destroyed that watchtower yeah, and they yeah. high five. <laughs> um, you know, like, but it was just, I think it was just really interesting. And like I said, it was really interesting to see, you know, like Rolf's backstory and his interaction with his dad. And mm -hmm. like, that probably explains why he drinks so much and he likes drinking. Yeah. Because that's his liquid courage. Right. Um, but I, like I said, I think, yeah, Volume 5 was really good, really entertaining. Um, there was a lot of good stuff in it, like the uh, the stone, the purification stone. I was just was about great. to bring that up, actually. That, that, like that, I was... Yeah, that whole thing yeah. was very smart, very funny. And I like yeah. the way it, it actually it came together really nicely with the story of how uh, Rolf accidentally crushed the crown with the... Uh, the uh, uh, War tyke. War tyke. With the war yeah, with the war yeah. tyke. And then, like, later on, he gets crushed by the Stone of Purification, and Rex is walking around with a bucket of... A bucket of dwarf. <laughs> Rolf. <laughs> Rolf. Yeah. A bucket of Rolf. And he... Like, yeah, that was great. That that all that all yeah. came together really nicely. Like, it was... It was funny. It was very... Yeah, it was very interesting and very, like... Like I said, that shows, like... I want to say, like, really great, like forethought and really great thing because no one else would have like you, you might yeah. not have thought of that like you didn't see like oh he gets crushed oh they're gonna just take him in a bucket and pour it <laughs> right. under the war tyke so he can get the crap like you don't see that yeah so i thought that was really uh yeah really funny really interesting really creative mm -hmm. like that whole but yeah this this whole that whole volume the whole volume was great so yes volume five very funny um uh so volume six now we're getting mm -hmm. into the the end of the series, like mm -hmm. the the plot essentially, what what there is of it has been building up until this fi these final six issues. Um, give me your just initial reaction to the ending, just uh, uh, just like summarize it as as simply as you can. And did you enjoy it? Did you know how did how did you feel about it? First impressions. Josh, you go first. Fantastic. Okay. You said as you said as simple I, as I possible. I said as simple as possible, and that was simple. You got me. Okay. <laughs> John. Uh, I, enjoyable. Enjoyable. Yes. Mm -hmm. I uh, I liked it. Part of me is kind of tempted to throw out this word though. Mm -hmm. Anticlimactic. Mm. How do you how do you contend with that? Am, am I wrong? Uh, yes. Okay. I, fair, I mean, okay. Well, discussion over. <laughs> well, I was gonna say I feel like it. It didn't. It it took a different approach than mm -hmm. probably what you were expecting. You wanted a more traditional, you know, ending. We've killed the bad guy, where he goes more into like the meta story behind all this and it... like reading the beginning with the, uh, uh, basically, like, his notes before, you know, he talked about how he would run, you know, 
Dungeons and Dragons mm-hmm. or you know these big uh, role playing epics like we you know like we did with uh, uh, yeah. Zero's Heroes and all that stuff and mm-hmm. that's how you know reading that and putting the last book into that frame makes so much sense that it's just it's a big kind of like D and D campaign it's a big role playing where just the DM and everyone's having a lot of fun sure. you don't really want it to end but it gives you enough closure to where you're, you know, satisfied. Now, I can see where you could say it's kind of anticlimactic, but he talks about, you know, with the archetypes, with, you know, the characterizations, and that while these two hero story might be done for now, the idea of these characters will continue to live on in all these different personas. And in the beginning, the, they do the ta- tavern tales at the beginning as well, just in, like, Volume 5, they introduce so many other uh, Rolf and Rex type characters but in all these different genres and tropes and it really comes together and it it helps balance out the end Josh that was very very well put yeah, I yeah. thank you. you I sound surprised. I, well, I you know I don't want to. Uh, Josh and I have a relationship that has existed long before we started doing this podcast. Um, <laughs> and uh, usually, when Josh and I are discussing film or books or whatever, uh, usually the conversation is sort of flip flopped. I'm usually the one saying all that kind of crap. And Josh, you gotta admit, you're usually the one that's like, I just want to see the explosion and the bad guy die. Yep. So this is very fascinating. Mm -hmm. Also, I think that you project a little too much onto me. I, you know me, Josh. You know I I love, I love a good meta narrative. Oh, I know. Uh, so I, I don't want to imply that I disliked this ending in any way. I never said you did. Ah, all right, fair enough. Yeah. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. We'll fight about it later. Um, uh, John, oh, please, this, please this, save us. Save us from fighting. Was, well, was, and, I, and I do think the point of it is, um, I think that Jim Zub probably knew that it, the ending itself would probably gonna, would kind of be anticlimactic with mm-hmm. the statement and the thing he was going to make, which is why most of that volume was like just a fight that kept escalating and escalating mm-hmm, and ex- mm-hmm. escalating and it was like pretty much an entire fight scene like for, for like, like six whole, issues yeah that whole final volume is pretty much just a massive fight mm-hmm. and it just keeps getting bigger and bigger and then it's like it can only get so big uh-huh. and so that's the point of it is like the fight kept growing and growing and growing and then eventually it the fight has to end but the the adventure doesn't end, but like that was just the big blow off. It's like you know, like they say, in, like in wrestling, you have like you have the first fight, you have like the second fight, you know, and like if the guys are tied, you have the blow off match, you have the rubber match, you have the match where it's like it, it all ends because if you don't have that, they'll just keep fighting mm-hmm. forever. And well, so did, yeah. Oh well, you can go. No, I was just gonna add on to you like what you were saying. Yeah, the the, the fighting got so big that they you know destroy the universe as it was. Yeah, right, yeah. right. So it's like they basically destroyed every like it just the fight was so massive it destroyed everything. So it's kind of like there's nowhere to go. It's um like it kind of reminds me of uh I don't know if do you have you guys ever either of you seen like Garen Lagan? The I, anime? No I haven't. No. Okay. Um well in that there's a there's like in the final episodes it gets to this point where it's like because it's a mecha show Mm -hmm. so like they have this giant robot but like as the series progresses like they keep adding parts to the robot and it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger until the point i think like at one point it like absorbs the moon or something (laughs) and then like the final fight is like basically like the the like very final boss and the crew of the lagan like throwing literal galaxies at each other like entire galaxies because it's gotten that big <laughs> um so there was a little bit of that in this because like in that series this it ends kind of in a similar fashion where it's like it gets so big that you can't have a climax um like yeah like the ending kind of seems anticlimactic to a lot of people but i think it's like you know it but i think for this that was kind of the point it's like they just undo everything so there's nowhere to go but back to like kind of the basics square one yeah, yeah. no I, I agree i uh, i totally get it too um i for the record i really like the last page 
yeah. uh, of the semi truck like driving at him. Right. Yeah. Um, I I think it's I think it was good. Um, I did think though that uh, as I was reading through it, it just sort of like it read really fast. Maybe it was just yeah. because well, of, maybe it was just because of all those double page spreads. But like I kind of got to the ending and I felt like I felt like just despite the fact that it was like six issues of a fight scene or however many issues it was, um, I felt like it. Uh, mean pages. What's that? You mean pages, not issues. Or however, however long the uh, the final, yeah, whatever the final issue. Yeah, yeah sorry. So I'm sorry. I'm I'm. I was, I was rambling. Uh, yeah, the final, the final issue, like however many pages of just a fight scene, um, mm-hmm. it did, uh, it did feel like, I, I felt like there was more that could have, or I don't want to say should have, because I don't want to like imply that Jim Zub should be doing it a specific way. I guess I was just expecting something a little bit more, and then mm-hmm. it just sort of like, it, it went. It went pretty much how I expected, uh, and it was like, it's what I would want from Skull Kickers. Like I like again, this is it, it was clearly all, uh, you know, playing in line with this theme of archetypes and, uh, you know, their their like literary positions as characters. <laughs> uh, what was when when all the uh, like alternate versions of them come busting in? What did they say? Uh, all the fictional versions. It's a clusterfic. Yeah, which yeah. I actually like. That was great. Lot, that, was a, that was a great yeah. joke. Yeah, and I was I was gonna say something about that, John. Uh, about yeah, your book Clusterfuck. Uh, yeah, I was like, obviously, nice. obviously, uh, there was a nod to me. No, I'm kidding. Yes, clearly, Jim Zub was referencing uh, John's book. No, yes, <laughs> we we do have fun. Um, but uh, no, I, I I liked it a lot. I did. Um, yeah. I I will admit, I will admit to sort of some sense of frustration. Because, mm-hmm. like, I felt like these, like, as we were saying, kind of like volumes three through six, you can see, like, a big shift in the way the story moves. Mm-hmm. And I, as as we uh, talked about earlier, the, I do think that the series keeps getting better and better the longer it goes on. So I'm a little disappointed that it kind of gets canceled right as I felt like it was the best it's ever been. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, so... It's it's always I hard. Agree. Okay, go ahead, go ahead, Josh. I would say I agree, but at the same time, I think good things, like all good things, must come to an end. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. If this dragged on for you know another six issues, would it be as good? Oh, I totally and, like, get that. Yeah, go out like, on top. Uh, yeah, it's like the Firefly argument. How everyone is like, oh my god, they need to bring it back, and then it's right. like, well, with what you have that you love so much, like right. if they brought it like if the, somehow they brought it back i mean it'd be like forever later but like if they did bring it back would it be the same it could right. yeah yeah and it, would that right. tarnish the image of it because you know because you have this one thing and it was stopped when it was good mm-hmm. you you have you know it's like it stays perfect forever you know like in your you know mind. all the all the like i really think like tv series when i think of this like breaking bad some people say it went on one or two longer but if it went on you know, more than six seasons, it would have got bloated. Mm-hmm. Just like, you know, The Office. Mm-hmm. I go back to my office. Like, I watched the first three seasons of The Office. You know, Jim Pam get together. Okay, you finish the story. Mm-hmm. It's it's over in my case. I don't need to see the next seven of, <laughs> right. you know, basically just poking the bloated corpse corpse yeah. yeah 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 i i agree i mean that's a problem that's a problem with serialized fiction you know you always like mm-hmm. i said you always want to go out on top you always want to leave them wanting more mm-hmm. um so yes th- in that sense i was a little disappointed that being said yeah uh, i me too i will admit i was yeah i was like oh but i'm i like the way they did it i i think yeah. it's i think it's the only way that this book could have ended uh mm-hmm. you know i mean it's like you said josh it's an ending that's not an ending yeah, mm-hmm. you know, which, again, that it just it that's all set up in the book. Like it's clearly what it's about. I yeah. liked it. I do think. Um, I I actually think that uh, Jim Zub could have done more with the concept of like mm. when they're getting into like the alternate realities and the archetypes 
and like the genre crossovers. Like I liked when they had like the post apocalyptic or like the zombie bikers guys come in, mm -hmm. and you had mm -hmm. the uh, like when they're when they're showing like when everything like kind of erupts and they're just like mm -hmm. in the negative space, or where they're showing them like uh, Rolf and Rex just constantly f falling through the different uh, like holes and coming out genres. of like, the genres. Yeah, yeah. I would have really love to have seen more of that specifically in the plot like right. and, and this is this is this gets into dangerous territory when you're when you're talking when you're discussing a book because i don't want to like say this like this is why it's bad because it didn't do the things that i wanted to do you know no, I, mm -hmm. i'm not implying that but i am saying uh as somebody who read the book i i enjoyed it but it my reaction as as another mm -hmm. creator it did <laughs> Uh, I, it inspires me. The book does inspire mm -hmm. me, and it really made me think of other things I would have liked to have seen in the ending. And I would have liked to have seen um, other versions of Rex and Rolf and uh, Kusia from, like, mm -hmm. other genres, not just action-adventure genres. Like, I would have mm -hmm. liked to have seen, like, the romantic comedy versions of them, or, like, the documentary film versions of them, or, right. you know, Lifetime well, movie I mean, channel, <laughs> you know, things you, like that. You kind of get that, like, the last, like, two pages where they're falling exactly. through, the, yeah, you, you get through that. the portals, you can make an entire series that's, out of just those pages. That's what I'm because saying. Because there's, like, at least ten different variations mm -hmm. of the two from, you know, basically, like, some sort of lava, fire ones. Yes, to exactly. To Knights. To bank robbers, to Sherlock and Holmes, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, Inuits, zombies, World War II. Uh, my personal favorite is the uh, comic book fan club where they're at the comic convention. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, X Men football. The X Men. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, there was a lot of those, and I, and I liked that. Yeah. I thought that was really funny, and I think that that is something that could have worked as like really good comedy in more than just like. Right. two splash pages like I would have liked to have seen right. now it's really easy for me to be like I really wish Jim Zub would have done more of that stuff that would have added like 50 more pages into the story you know I, right. I know how at I... the same time <laughs> yeah. like, he did do that at the beginning with at least like five or six because you have the, the monks yeah uh, my personal favorite Axeman Skull Knight basically a parody of uh, old Batman and Robin where yeah, they the beat people stuff. Yeah. four um <laughs> yeah you know, 1960s uh, space. Sure, sure. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I mean, yeah, it is... Fish people, a whole bunch, yeah. It is funny, and it, you, yes, he's still doing it. But I am still I'm still saying, essentially, because of the constraints of what this comic is, it's an action-adventure comic, mm -hmm. there are still variations on action-adventure characters. Like, I, <laughs> I would have liked to have seen it expand a little bit more into something beyond just action-adventure characters. You know? Yeah. You get, okay. you get what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Now, I, that's hard to do. Like, yeah. uh, I, I freely it's admit, hard. it would be very yeah. hard to do that. But, um... You really want, you know, like, a full book about Rex and Rolf, <laughs> Crab Fisherman? <laughs> exactly! No, I just, I mean, I'm just saying, that's what I would have liked to have seen show up. Or, again, going back to playing... Tax with, accounts? Playing, yeah, well, playing with genres. Like the, yeah. like, mm -hmm. like the drama version of the characters, where one of them is dying from AIDS, and the other one is trying to, like, raise money for him. They have no use for <laughs> fighting. But, like, you know, it's just, like, these are the versions of the characters. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just We're saying. Pulling a Brian song into it. <laughs> exactly. I'm, I'm saying that that would have been funny, and that would have been like, it, I don't know how, I don't know where it would have fit into that story, but that's just immediately what I was thinking of. Was like, I really would have liked to have seen this whole like cross genre thing really amplified and really. Uh, like but then, would you take away the archetype that these are, you know, action yeah. characters that they are basically heroes who fight. This villain, the Brian Song versions of them <laughs> wouldn't be fighting a giant thule. Yeah, they're fighting demon. cancer. Or any, oh, oh, fair enough. But no, but, but but yes, you are also right in that regard. You, they are still like all this talk of archetypes. They are still archetypes within the action genre. I, mm -hmm. I, I, I agree. I'm, and that's why I I still maintain that I think it works just fine the way the way it is. It's it's good. It's not bad. But um, that's just that was just something that I immediately thought of, like yeah. when reading this book, <laughs> the Brian Song version of the characters. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now you know why I have so many discussions. <laughs> uh, anyway. But um, yeah, I 
it's it, it's good. It it is good. Mm-hmm. I know it sounds like I'm sort of like uh, uh, reluctantly saying that, but I don't I, I don't mean it to sound like that. I no, I did like it. Not. I did like it. Yeah. I yeah. just I just like to pick at things, you know. I'm, <laughs> Josh can vouch for yes. that. Yes. <laughs> Ask me how I feel about uh, Mad Max Fury Road if you want to have a long, <laughs> a long boring discussion. <laughs> uh, I think I'm okay for right yeah, now. We, yeah, we don't need to do that. We don't need to do that. Uh, or that what hour and a half long discussion about arguing the definition of pedantic. <laughs> that was one of my favorite arguments of all time. Oh, God. <laughs> well, for the record, I just tuned out for most of that. Yeah. That was a good one. All right. Well, we're we're getting into uh, inside joke territory. Yes. Poor John's getting left out. So, um, fine. <laughs> it's, it's all right. So, uh, yeah. So, um, one of the things I I, I said a little while ago, mm-hmm. we were going to talk about uh, how the series gets better as it progresses. Mm-hmm. So here's something. I'm gonna I'm just gonna kind of spit this all out. Josh, I don't know how you're going to feel about this. John, I think you probably have more to say about this than Josh, but that's not not mm-hmm. a slight against you, Josh. No um, problem. So, one of the things that is very frustrating about making comic books in today's market, especially making an indie creator-owned comic, is mm-hmm. getting the readership there to make publishing it worthwhile. And Skull Kickers is kind of a good example of this because Jim Zub has been very open about the sales figures of Skull Kickers. Mm-hmm. And there was a period there, I think in volume two and three, where sales were very low. Like yeah. like incredibly low. And the fact yeah. of the matter is that this book would not have been funded just based off the sales of the book. I think Jim Zub has said something and I mean anybody of course correct me if I'm wrong. But I think I think Jim Zub has said something to the effect of like he he's got another job like he's a teacher, and he does yeah. other art stuff, and he makes enough money doing that, to fully finance six issues a year of Skull Kickers, so the books yeah. basically get completely funded by him. Now yeah. I really sympathize with that because that's pretty much how I make my comics, and John, I'm sure that's similar to how you make your yeah. comics. Now I can't afford mm-hmm. to make six full color issues a year, but you know, that's them's the breaks. But yeah, so um, we're in this we're in this situation where uh, it's it can be very hard to produce an independent creator owned comic, and um, yeah. Uh, a, a, it's, so what, what I think what we see is that a lot of long form series, they're very hard to pull off. Like they basically have to be an overnight success. Like they have to be instantly successful. And I think you see this even at like Marvel and DC. Like Marvel mm-hmm. will cancel a series after like six issues if it's not doing really well. And I've heard yeah. other comic book fans complain about this. This is always this constant complaint is that you don't see these long series that take time to develop and really get into the swing of things. It's always either it's an instant success or it's canceled and you move on to the next thing. And Mm -hmm. uh, I do think that this is a problem within the comic book industry because, like, it doesn't allow for stories to really build into these long epics that I think a lot of classic comics, especially classic comic book fans, really got out of, like, older comics. I mean, freaking Mm -hmm. X-Men. You know, Chris Claremont wrote that book for, like, 17 years. You know, he only followed through on, like, 40% of his plot lines, but it was still a big payoff whenever he eventually got around to doing them. Mm -hmm. But, um... (laughs) Not a little joke for my X Men fans, listeners there. Um, so anyway, Alex. Yeah, Alex, my friend Alex. <laughs> a little joke for him. Um, so uh, anyway, so kind of what I'm what I'm what I'm getting at here is, uh, I think that I, I've, I've noticed this trend with these on with ongoing series now mm-hmm. is that the first volume is essentially completely self contained volume. You don't want to mm-hmm. set up things that you're not going to be able to uh, address later on. You don't want to have, you don't want to do your book, do your six issues, have it end on a cliffhanger, and then have the book get yeah. canceled because nobody's buying it. Yeah. And um, and again, this, this is kind of going back to what I was saying. Like I've I've heard people complain about this. this is a problem with comic books because 
you know, I, I nobody gives books a chance, and et cetera, et cetera. But at the same time, you know, that's them's the financial breaks. You can't produce a book that's losing money. You know what I mean? Like Jim Zub can, because he decides mm-hmm. to, and that's what's great about creator owned comics. You know, he yeah. he decided that this is what he wanted to do for this book, and yeah. um, but you know, like you know, penny pinchers at Marvel or DC. You know, they somebody's calling the shots, and at some point they got to say this book's not worth it. If mm-hmm. anyway, so that's a, that's a little digression from my main point. My pain, my main point then was, so you, we see a lot of these series where volume one is basically a standalone story, and then mm-hmm. volume two sort of slowly picks up on things where it could sort of continue. And then mm-hmm. if you get, if you're lucky enough to kind of keep going to like a three or a four, then you start seeing like bigger story arc stuff that start to build into a bigger plot. Mm-hmm. And I just found it interesting because that's essentially exactly what happened with Skull Kickers, right? Like, yeah. Yeah. And when we were talking yeah. about that, um, I, and I, because I think that the, the I mean, in, I don't. I don't want to imply that the bigger plot is why volumes three, four, and five are really, really good. Mm-hmm. But uh, I think that it's a part of it. Yeah. Well, I mean, kind of look at you know, the same can be said with movies. Mm-hmm. Oh you know, man! Especially like Marvel's, you know, formula for printing money right now with our, <laughs> right. all their movies. Right. You do the one. You do the first one, which sets up the character. And then after that is when you can have the big, like, you know, Avengers movies where you, you know, you've already answered, well, who was that and what are his powers type of thing. And it just, it applies more, you know, to comics as well. Whereas, like, you know, a book, people are going to read, you know, at least halfway through the book. So where you have the first couple chapters allowed to set up the character. And it's just, like I said, it's the character arc. Mm-hmm. I think people today aren't as patient they, they they want, like you said, the big explosions right now. They want the immediate payoff. Yeah, I I, I see what you're saying. I, I'm i not entirely sure that's... Um, I mean, that's not entirely what I'm getting at. I, I think what I'm getting at okay. is that just like the nature of the way these uh, long-form series develop is you, you kind of see these... You see these books kind of all take on the same formula due to the constrictions of the money or lack of money mm. in the comic book okay. industry. That's that's kind of what I'm talking about. And that does, of course, yeah. tie into the audience because if the audience isn't there, then the money's not there. But um, right. I don't think that's not exactly the same. But I do think I do think you're right. Uh, you do kind of see that in movies too when you see a studio will uh, make a movie and it'll be really successful. And they'll say, "Oh, okay. Well, let's turn it into a trilogy." And they film oh, the Matrix, the Matrix, uh, Pirates of the Caribbean. Yeah, like all of mm-hmm. these films. Then they'll film two and three back to back, to turn it into an ongoing, like an ongoing epic. And really, you just mm-hmm. had one standalone movie that worked on its own. And then you have all these other movies that are like endless continuity, uh, just sinkholes, you know, and. Mm-hmm. And I because mean, like what you were saying, Josh, with Marvel's formula, that's true. That is their formula, and that's probably why I don't like any of their sequels because I don't like serialized fiction in film. I like mm. serialized fiction in comics and TV and whatever else, but for a film, I prefer it to be a standalone, uh, right. like a standalone story. We were talking mm-hmm. about this, yes. You know, Iron Man versus like Dread. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Dread's like my favorite movie. Yep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. So, I don't know. I just it just was something I like thinking about, like finishing this series and just kind of contemplating Skull Kickers and why I liked it and you know like mm-hmm. what works about it and what doesn't work about it. It got to me me to thinking kind of just about the nature of comics and how how like uh, it's almost like all of my favorite aspects of Skull Kickers sort of like grew out of adversity like of like the challenge mm-hmm. of making the book like it it through sheer, sheer force of will Jim Zub was able to force this book into the double digits and uh, you know double digits issues and really get it into a position where I thought it really all came together really nicely but like other I guess I guess what I'm saying is I'm just I'm just kind of lamenting that other books 
you know, they, they don't necessarily have that opportunity. You know, they don't can't necessarily finance them, and so they'll, mm -hmm. you know, they'll end after the first volume, and you just have your fun little single volume of two characters running around killing each other, and that's it. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Uh, that's just sort of me popping off. Uh, I don't. I don't. I don't know if you, John, if you have any uh, thoughts about that as another comic book creator. Well, like you. Well, you said a lot. So I, I like, know, dude. I, I like rambled on there for a while. I like, so, um, <laughs> I don't know. Like, like I said, I uh, no, I, I I do see it's very hard. I do think like stories like that, like you know, like the like getting skull kickers, like it does kind of give you hope and it does kind of help you kind. Of, it helps you figure out your way, but it is like I'm pretty sure like Jim Zub is like he's like a professor. I'm pretty sure he's a professor of animation. Yes. Like so, he, it. It it's like a different like there are different uh, incomes different like things to like spend money on I don't know how to explain it but basically it's like <laughs> it's a lot different like and I don't want like I don't want to get a whole thing but I do remember there was like somebody on Twitter and they were talking about the fact that there are a lot of creators in Canada because they have universal health care mm -hmm. and health insurance is not as expensive so they have the financial stability to make comics. So sure. you see a lot of creators like in Canada that can do that whereas in America it's like I'm spending a lot of money like I uh, most of my money goes to my health insurance bill. Like yeah. Like a ridiculous degree. So it's like, oh, am I going to pay for my health insurance or am I going to get this short story uh, drawn up and lettered mm -hmm. or colored or inked or whatever. It's like you got to make those choices and I think that's why some people it's like it's a hard thing to do i don't know but there's i think there are a lot of factors but i do but i do think for the most part like a lot of the advice and a lot of the things that you know he talks about it does kind of help it hopefully it helps a lot of people and a lot of creators navigate because yeah this was a good you know this was a good story and i'm glad that it got at least it got a completion like even mm -hmm. if it was a seemingly premature you know what i mean like yeah even if yeah. it was like you knew it could have gone on longer. It's like at least they got to finish. Some people they just get, uh, you know, like we you even said it. It's like they end their volume or they end their issue with a cliffhanger and that's it. That's all you get. It's like uh, was it that show John Doe? Did you ever watch that with Dominic Purcell? Like <laughs> I didn't watch it. Was a it, long no. time ago. Um, it's like yeah, the, I watched the season finale and then it was like a big plot twist. Like his best friend turned out to be the bad guy and then you never find out what happened. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> it's like. You know, like, you, you just don't know. You'll never find out. And so it's, like, that same kind of thing. Like, so I think a lot of creators, they do, you know, it, it's very, it is in their best interest to make a self-contained story. Mm -hmm. But it, it is rough that you sometimes you just can't keep going. You can't build. Because, you know, obviously there are people that probably have bigger ideas. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, that's always... I, that's, I mean, that's certainly my problem with creating comics, and I've always—that's like the number one advice always given to people that want to start creating comics yeah, is start small. Start small. Everybody that wants to make a comic has an idea for a hundred issue comic series, and yeah. let me tell you, after like the first issue, it will become mm -hmm. very apparent that you are not going to make a hundred issues. <laughs> like okay. very, very apparent. But I will say, well, I have to say because I. But I like we already talked about like uh, you know I my first comic was Secrets and Shadows, mm -hmm. so it was so it was very much a 132 page yeah book. But once again, I was working in Japan. I had healthcare. I had a good. I had a, my health insurance was through my job. I didn't have to pay like ridiculous money, so I could, you know, the cost of living where I lived. I wasn't in Tokyo, so it's like my cost of living was very low. My paycheck was very good. Yeah. So I could afford to do that stuff. I mean, like, my, part of my Japan money funded Clusterfuck. Like, I can't, I don't know if I can do that now, but it helps. Like, it helped mm -hmm. a lot. And some people, they won't admit that, though. They won't admit, like, oh, I can't, you know. Which is why, you know, I respect that he says that, because some people, they'll just be like, oh, you got to work for it. You got to oh, work hard. I agree. And then it's like, yeah. yeah. I hate they're that like, oh, so I, much. <laughs> they're like, I worked hard, and I did this, and, you know, you got to scrap and blah, blah, blah. And then you find out, oh, you don't have to pay this, or, oh, you have a job that does this and this and this. Mm -hmm. So it's like, they're not realistic, but I could be realistic and say, because I tell people, I'm like, don't do a big story. I did a big story. It was hard. Yeah. It was very hard, and it was time-consuming. It took years, 
and I have it now, but going through that process, I wouldn't have been able to do it if I did, wasn't working in Japan. Mm-hmm. If I wasn't making that ALT check, I wouldn't have been able to do it. So, yeah. Yeah, I wasn't going to say this because I don't want to sound like I'm a big braggart or anything. I'm not a big social signaler, but uh, Jim Zub does have a Patreon up, and uh, I actually mm-hmm. I am backing him right now on Patreon, which is great because as a comic book writer... I like to be able to look at his scripts and kind of see how he formats things and see how he writes yeah. to kind of give me that little yeah. extra insight. Because there's not a lot of stuff out there for like people that want to be comic book writers. Like it's yeah. not it's not like it's not like Hollywood where they demand everything to be like a certain like they have very strict rules on how scripts need to be formatted to be even read by anybody. Comics yeah. are not like that. It's very much like yeah. the Wild West. Yeah. So so yeah, Jim Zub's awesome. Mm-hmm. So. I think uh, I think that's as uh, much as I can ramble on about Jim Zub and our little our little tangent there. So, in conclusion, Skull Kickers, um, where where would you place it on on list of your favorite fantasy western genre crossing action adventure comedy comic book list out of all of the comics of those types that you have read? <laughs> where, would you, <laughs> where would you put Skull Kickers on that list? Mine would be number one. I think it's the best one of those that I've read. Well, yeah, I guess I have to say number one for something that yeah for that specific yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, maybe we could open it up a little bit. Where would you put Skull Kickers? I I think overall I would say it's a very entertaining book, and uh, if you like just like good action comedy. This mm-hmm. book is for you. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I think we said. I, think, it, I mm. think we said in previous episodes that this book feels like, uh, like the kind of book that's like tailor made for just like people that like to play Dungeons and Dragons and people that like just like sit around with their group of friends and play games. This this feels like a book that's like about them almost. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Not very much so. Mm-hmm. So um, that's good. I I am I'm a little a little disappointed that uh, I'm not getting any more skull kickers. But uh, John, how much other mm-hmm. how much other Jim Zub books have you read? Have you read Wayward? I I did when I when I got the last um, Skull Kickers Treasure Trove at C two E two. I did pick up the first volume of Wayward. Mm-hmm. I enjoyed it. It it's very much. Um, it's you know like it's obviously not going to be skull kickers sure, I, I, sure. I, that would be weird <laughs> um but it's you know it's a very good book it's very entertaining um it's more it's kind of it's not self-contained i don't it, for that first volume so i think that would be an interesting book maybe if you wanted to read it mm-hmm. um As because a, it like does end on a cliffhanger Oh, yeah, okay. it, it makes a nice contrast and it does end on a cliffhanger and it is sort and it is a very different uh, tone and a very different style, and you know, because it's a, you know, obviously it's a different artist, but it's like m- a very different kind of book. Mm-hmm. So I've only read the first volume. Um, I haven't gotten the second one yet, but from what I read, I I am interested to see, to see where it goes. I just have been busy with you know ah. clusterfuck and stuff like that. I know how it is. Yes. Yeah. So. Yeah, I I'll have to take a look at that. Um, the other. Jim Zub books that I'm interested in reading and I know Josh you'd be interested in looking at these too is that Jim Zub wrote the Samurai Jack comics not too long ago. Oh yeah yeah yeah. Nice. And uh, I've heard that those are pretty good. Uh, I've, yeah. I've seen like I follow Jim Zub on Facebook and I've seen him post you know lots of art for everything that he's working on and the Samurai Jack comics always look good but I'm just really slow to buying comic books these days but I need to make a big Amazon purchase. I'm mm-hmm. With apologies to my local comic book shop, but I need okay, to make a big. Not go down and <laughs> clear out your uh, pull box. I I'm getting there. I, we're cutting this part out of the podcast. I don't want to sound <laughs> like a jerk. <laughs> uh, yeah. But yeah, um, yeah, we'll have to um, we'll have to do another Jim Sub book and see see how it compares to Skull Cakers. Mm-hmm. 
I, but I will say it's very different. So it's like you kind of have to go in, like if like you were to do Wayward or something. Mm-hmm. It's obviously very different. Well, so sure. it'd be like you kind of have to, yeah. I mean, I, get, I always say that because yeah, like, yeah. I understand. You know, it's it's difficult because you always have certain expectations. I mean, even as a as a creator, that's difficult. I can tell you, like, because mm-hmm. like you always want to do different things, but at the same time. I'm always you're or not me, but I mean I imagine writers and creators in general are always mm-hmm. kind of in this position of being pigeonholed. You know, if you, if you've got an audience that expects one thing but you want to do something else, you know, that's a tough spot to be in. Yeah, just like a Jim Henson. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a good example. Very good example. Uh, but anyway, so I think that's about going to wrap up this episode of Comic DNA. John and Josh, mm-hmm. thank you for both coming back and talking about this comic with me. No problem. You're welcome. I was I was very happy to read some comics. I haven't I haven't been reading a lot lately, so it was nice to kind of take a break and just read, and then go on endless rants about nonsense. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but anyway, so yes, I am Aaron Walther. You can find me on Facebook. You can find me on Twitter at a a w a l t h e r. A.A. Walther at Twitter, and you can find new episodes of this podcast at comicdna.podbean.com I think that's what it is um, I'll edit this in later if that's wrong, and uh, you, can, you can read the comic that I'm writing right now, I'm writing a comic called The Birdlander with artist Ed Bickford, and you can find it at www.thebirdlander.com check that out it's for free to read online uh, John, where can people find more of your stuff? Okay, um, you can follow me on Twitter at John H. Parrish. Um, let's see, you can find me on Facebook at JP Comic Writer. Um, you can find my first series, Secrets of the Shadows, and a bunch of short stories I've written at secretsandshadows.net. And you can find my newest book, uh, Clusterfuck, uh, everywhere. It's a, di- a diamond distributed book. You can find it on Amazon, Barnes and Noble. You can get it at your local comic shop. You can get them to order it, um, and you can get it on Comixology. Wherever it is, you can find it. Um, and yeah, those are pretty much. That's pretty much everywhere you can find me. That is awesome. That's uh, clusterfuck. That's put out by Alterna, right? Yes, Alterna Comics. Alterna Comics. So that's that's great. Yeah, I've 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 I think I vouched for this in the previous episode, but I've personally read Clusterfuck, and I absolutely recommend it to anybody, especially if you like Skull Kickers. I think I actually think the two books are very similar, not not necessarily in content, but in uh, tone and style. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, that's good. And, uh, Josh, you, um, you know, you're around. Uh, but you can find Josh. Uh, Josh and I co-created and co-write a comic called Time Agent Z, which appeared in my science fiction anthology series, Science Hero, and that is available on Comixology. You can go on to Comixology and type in Science Hero. You will find four issues of that comic, and each issue has a short installment of Time Agent Z, written by me, myself, and Mr. Josh Blessingame. Yep. Well, all righty. I think that's going to do it then. Thanks, everybody, for listening. We'll see you all next time.